about ready to look at a couple of passages of scripture uh, in the in the mid chapters of the book of Genesis, chapter 21, chapter 22, um, and those passages of scripture are very important for setting up an eschatological principle that we have been kind of working our way toward understanding, and that has to do with the Jews, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but as I showed those passages to you last week at the very end of our time together, it uh, elicited a question about the use of the word offspring. Um, almost, I want to say, just about all of the English translations that are more modern will use offspring, some will use descendants, some will use children, uh, and some, some occasionally, I think even King James does at points, uses C. Uh, and so those are all the kinds of words that, that in English language more or less translate this little Hebrew word here, uh, Zerah. Um, that word is a word that means a variety of things in Hebrew. It can mean seed, uh, it can mean sowing, so if it's used as a verb in a certain context, it literally means, you know, planting seeds in the ground. Um, and it, it can mean, it can refer to um, things like children. So uh, it's used in a variety of those ways. And um, however, it is a, and I mentioned this last week, and I realized I probably, just a little bit of comments I made at the very end of time, there probably had a chance of causing more confusion than it was worth which is why we're visiting it again tonight. Uh, but it's a collective noun. Now, a collective noun is a noun, generally speaking, um, it is in a singular form. But it refers to not a singular thing, but a number of things. Now, the interesting thing about collective na nouns, uh, they're not always this way, but they are certainly this way uh, in some things that you would readily think about. Like C is a collective noun both in Hebrew and in English. Uh, when you say seed, uh, you could be referring to a singular, you know, maybe it's a sunflower seed. You could be referring to that. Or if you had a bag of grass seed, you could be saying, oh yeah, I, I got a bag of seed out in the shed. And either one of those uses would be, would be appropriate. Same thing with deer, right? If you say, oh, I saw a deer the other day. Now we know because you use the article that you were talking singularly, but if you said, oh, I saw all kinds of deer the other day, then there is no article. We would know that it's plural, but the word is the same whether it's singular or plural. There's not a plural form for it. Um, there's even, um, uh, there's even you know, some other things, like, for instance, in one of the places we'll look in tonight, we'll see another collective noun, the word dust. Now, dust means a collection of particles. Uh, it can be used, uh, you know, if you had one bit of dust, you could refer to that as dust, or you could be referring to a, you know, a, a whole a bunch of dust. You know, if you look under the bed and see little eyes looking back at you, it's not a dust bunny, it might be something else, but, you know, you can refer to anything under there as dust. Uh, so all of these kinds of things are collective nouns. When you have collective nouns, um, it presents a little bit of uh, a little bit of a challenge in interpreting what you're reading, uh, particularly when it comes to the Bible, because you have to find out, you know, whether you're talking about something that's one singular, since it's singular in its form, as, as far as the noun goes, it's singular in its form. So is it one, or is it talking about, even though it's singular, many? So that's the thing that has to be determined. And so uh, that's the challenge, and uh, <laughs> uh, this is what we have. Now, there is one and only one case in the entire scripture. Well, I should say the Old Testament, because we're talking Hebrew here. So there's only one place in the entire Old Testament where this particular uh, noun is used in its uh, plural form. And basically, uh, anytime you see the I am, you know, if you're reading the Old Testament, and you're reading something out of, out of the Hebrew and they bring it, instead of trying to translate it into English terms, they just bring it as it is from Hebrew into the English and they put it in the Bible and it has an I am at the end of it. That is the convention in the Hebrew language for plural. So generally speaking, if you see an I am, it's a plural form. But there again, sometimes you have plurals 
that don't refer to more than one. Sometimes you have plurals that refer to one. So you have the, almost the opposite of a collective noun. You have something that's in plural form, but really is singular. Um, so anyhow, uh, all kinds of interesting little uh, grammatical things that come up in the Bible. But that's the only place that it's used in the entire um, Old Testament, the plural form C. Uh, every other time, you have got to go through a, a little bit of exercise, look at the context, look to see if there's anything else written in the scripture that, that addresses that particular verse uh, to see whether or not you're talking about something that's singular or plural. Um, now, uh, it, it, you know, just to get a handle on this, if the reference, uh, if a reference is made uh, to something that is uh, individual, like say you had uh, several seeds in a row sitting on your table uh, on a table in front of you, and you had maybe a sunflower seed, and maybe you had we got zinnias growing here, maybe you had a zinnia seed, maybe you had a little kernel of corn, maybe you had some other kind of a seed on there. Um, now, if you said um, you know, this is C, uh, that would not be a proper use of a collective noun because those are all different sorts. They, they really are not a group. They really can't be considered the collective that you use a collective noun for. So there you would have to call it seeds. So if, if, uh, if the reference is to each seed individually, sometimes you'll see um, this referred to mostly when you come across English dictionaries and grammars and stuff like that, it is called a count noun. In other words, you know, it, it, the individual thing matters more than, than the classification. Um, so uh, the plural would be proper there, but if it's in a, um, but there's not a single instance of that in the Bible. So we don't have a singular instance of, of people having a collection of different kinds of seeds. Uh, that's that's never that never comes up. So uh, that's the that's basically the, the Hebrew background uh, to uh, the issues that go with dealing with this particular concept. And if you recall, I made a big deal about this in Genesis chapter three because in Genesis chapter three, verse number fifteen, uh, C is mentioned you know, several times, and it's all about. It's all about the condition of the cursing of, of the, the serpent, the cursing of Eve, and about that proto-evangelion that we've been talking about, about uh, the promise of a redeemer. So, um, you know, that's why this is in, important. So, uh, having said that, let's take a look at some of the areas that come into question in the book of Genesis in particular, because this is where we're setting up. We, we are about to, to establish a very strong eschatological prophetic principle concerning the Jewish people. Uh, this principle is founded upon things that are said in the book of Genesis. You know, remember I've, I've made the point that God doesn't break promises. Promises were made to Abraham. Uh, he, promises were made to Eve. These promises will not be broken, but the ones made to Abraham concerning his line after him these things absolutely will not be broken, and because of that, those things, uh, it gives us uh, perhaps the strongest eschatological or uh, hermeneutic uh, in dealing with eschatological passages. Remember, I said it's all about the Jews. It's all about the Jews. So let's look at some of these uh, some of these uh, uses. Now, uh, Genesis 3:15. This is the passage uh, right there beside the Proto-Evangelion, and. Uh, in that context, it, it, it basically tells us, it's, you know, God speaking to Eve, he says to her that her seed will bruise the serpent's head, right? Um, now, in telling her that, and it's singular, uh, I didn't really explain why, I just kind of laid it out there for you, and, and uh, you know, such as it, as it was. Now, I did, uh, I, I did find solace in the Apostle Paul's speech in his uh, letter in Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 where he really points this out and we'll talk about this as we work down the page a little bit that that the promises made to Abraham and his seed that those things he said were really not uh, because it was singular they were really not about seeds it was not about a whole bunch of people it was really about Christ 
Um, keep that in mind. Uh, that comes into play. Now, it doesn't come into play in Genesis chapter 3 directly. I mean, it's in some sense, it's, it's maybe precedent setting that the Apostle Paul had that in Galatians chapter 3. You know, it kind of makes you, your ears perk up and you read Genesis passages a little clearer, especially when they're talking about, about promises that are coming in a long, you know, in a long time in the future. But in Genesis chapter 3, it actually, the context actually stands by itself. We don't even need Paul's commentary here to prove the point because what you do is you go from the you go from the uh, the plural uh, or the, uh, the collective noun singular C uh, and you go to a second person he uh, when it talks about the seed. So it says that your your seed will bruise his head, and then it, it talks about the seed himself that that he will. Uh, that he will crush the serpent's head, or his he will be bruised, I should say. Uh, he will crush the serpent's head. So you go to a second person there. Um, uh, you go to a second person with a combination of a third person, all in singular. So you go from the, the collective noun, offspring, singular always in form, but sometimes it's plural and sometimes it's singular. Context will tell you which is which. But in the context, that you have there in Genesis chapter 3 because it speaks about E, singular third person, you know, in, in talking about that C, you know that that C is singular. Does that make sense? Right. How do we know that the C in Genesis chapter 3.15 is singular? Because it's followed immediately with, a, with a, an antecedent. It's the antecedent to a, to a pronoun that is third person singular. So that tells you that the seed is singular. In other words, the pronoun that references the seed is third person singular, therefore the seed is singular. I think I got that. You all with me? Okay. <laughs> They're shaking your headset. So yeah, we got it. All right. Um, now, that also happens in Genesis chapter 21. We'll be looking at this in a little more detail uh, in just a few minutes. But in Genesis chapter 21, Context of what, uh, as well is what rules the roost in this particular passage uh, because uh, even though that passage is talking about Abraham and the blessing of his offspring, his seed, again, it's that collective noun. It's, it's, a, it's a singular in form, but it can be either referring to you know, one thing, one unique thing, or it can be referring to a bunch of stuff, a bunch of things. Um, but in that particular passage, there again, the, the reference to the offspring is uh, combined with references that the offspring refers to. So the, the offspring in the, that context refers to, on the one hand, Isaac. Isaac is the one through which your offspring will be named. Uh, and then it talks about Ishmael also being your offspring. Now, Ishmael is singular. Isaac is singular, so what does the, the word uh, seed refer to there? It refers to something singular. Because the thing that, that that offspring refers to is mentioned in the context. And what is mentioned in the context is the singular Ishmael and the singular Isaac. Okay. So in this particular case, context tells us that seed, offspring, this collective this collective noun is singular rather than, than plural. It is always singular, but singular rather than referring to many. Um, Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. Um, now, a lot of folks think that this is particularly what Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter 3, verse number 16. Uh, and it's you know, certainly a, a reasonable perspective, but, but Paul is so general uh, in his statements in Galatians chapter 3 about this particular reality that you know he kind of talks about in general terms the promises made to Abraham, uh, and so um, you know does it refer only does Galatians chapter three only refer to uh, Genesis chapter twelve verse number seven? I don't think there's a good case to say that. I think that you have to be uh, you have to take in mind that that Paul was generalizing. Um, a certain reality there, promises made to Abram about offspring. 
So any place that you see that promise of God making a promise to Abram about offspring, you have to look at it carefully. Because uh, according, we'll call it the Paul rule here, right? According to the Paul rule, uh, it, that it may well be about Christ. It may not be about all the children of Israel. It may ultimately have really been pointed at Jesus Christ. So uh, what's going to tell you the, the difference? Context, right? <laughs> Context is king. Um, so anyhow, Genesis chapter 12, uh, context says it's a collective noun there. Uh, I, I don't think anybody on the first reading of Genesis chapter 12, uh, verse number 7, would, would think that that is referring to a singular person. I mean, it just, when you read it, I think the natural way that it just pops off the page at you is that this is talking about a line of descendants. And we would all, we would basically happily take it that way, except for the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, not so fast. Right? We would have never thought about it that way had it not been for the Holy Spirit inspired Apostle Paul, who says in his little uh, comments on this, uh, on this particular promise that it was singular because it was referring to Christ. Okay? So, um, sometimes context tells us. At other times, other scripture tells us. What was one of the hermeneutical principles we learned earlier? Scripture interprets Scripture. So always remember that if there's any issue at all or if there's some deeper thing that a, that a passage is trying to get to, someplace else in Scripture is going to open that up. Someplace else in Scripture is going to give you what you need. Um, Genesis chapter 13, uh, this is in uh, uh, verses 14 to 13, 16. I look at that. i got a semicolon instead of a colon. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, the context tells you there, and that that particular passage, um, because the offspring are then related to, uh, by way of analogy, dust. So if if the thing that the offspring, you know, it, it, same words used, right? The same the same singular collective noun is used, but right there in the context, in the very same space, it tells us that that refers to his offspring being. You know, if you can count the dust, you'll be able to count your offspring. So, uh, what does that tell us? Well, the context gives us the, the, the cue here, and it tells us that in this case, uh, seed is meant to refer to uh, a collective. It's meant to refer to all of the offspring uh, to, uh, to Abraham. So, uh, the dust gives us the clue in that context. And then in Genesis uh, chapter 22, now this is a weird passage because actually both things are working. And in verse number 17, it's plural by context. If you look at what's going on in verse number 17, uh, certainly the context says that's collective. It's not talking about one, it's talking about uh, a whole bunch. All right? But if you get into verse number 18, then you see that that's really... Uh, something that, that the Apostle Paul, because his references are general, and remember I said you can't take it from, from what's actually said in the book of Galatians chapter 3, you can't pinpoint that because he's not, he's not direct or specific in his quotation of a specific text. He speaks in a generality. And so anything that fits the generality, anything that's in the class of the generality, is going to be, you know, whatever he's saying is going to be true of it. And so he says something is true of this generality. So anything that is part of that generality, this, you know, what he said has got to, uh, to play into your understanding of it. And verse number 18 does that. So in verse number 18, you have something that is clearly talking about many offspring, same word used, and it's talking about something singular, which Paul says ultimately is Christ, same word used. Um, but it, you, what you, what you, uh, uh, understand all of these things through is is by context. That's the first clue, and then whether or not what the commentary of the Apostle Paul, whether or not it actually uh, refers to this particular uh, passage. So, if the commentary that the Apostle Paul gave, the categories that he set up there, if that is true for what you're looking at, well, then what he said is true, and uh, if not, then it's the context that tells you.
And that's it. So what does that mean? Well, you know, it means that, that uh, we have somewhat of a mixed bag, but for the most part, uh, we have uh, very much in the Proto-Evangelion something that is a remarkable promise because at the very first mention of things, it's, it's singular. Uh, offspring is singular, and the reference to him in that third person singular, singular, so it's talking about something singular. So when God was talking to Eve about her seed, he was talking about one person, a male person, no less, because the third person, masculine. So one singular man. Again, you know, I think it's fascinating that he spoke that to Eve and called it her seed, but never included, never included Adam. And you know, to me, that is that is such a remarkable little segment right there in the beginning, beginning of Genesis. I've often, I've often said, you've heard me say it before, Genesis one through three are the most profound three chapters in the entire Bible. They are deep, incredibly deep, incredibly rich. And so, uh, not that the rest of the Gen uh, book of Genesis doesn't have some interesting things to say, it certainly does, but uh, that, that, uh, you know, that portion of Genesis is particularly deep. God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy, now this is talking about Ishmael, uh, do not be distressed about the boy and your slave woman, Hagar, uh, listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring are going to be reckoned. Okay. Now, this is a, a very important concept, right? Because in this concept, uh, God's focus on things promised to Abraham are very clearly focused to one line in human history, one family in human history. Abraham had lots of families. Right? Abraham had lots of wives by the time he died, and he had lots of children. And uh, they had, you know, it wasn't just uh, wasn't just Ishmael. There was a whole bunch of others that are, uh, you know, most of them were just, and he had other sons and daughters, that kind of thing. But he had lots of other children, and none of them, none of them are the children that count for the promise that God made to Abraham. He blessed those children like he did Ishmael. Um, but those children have nothing to do with the promise that God made Abraham. The promise that God made Abraham from the start and kept on repeating it through all those various places, uh, you know, in the early, uh, early mid-chapters of, of Genesis, they all come down to, they all come down to Isaac. Isaac is the one and the only one that actually is the uh, benefactor of the promises made to Abraham. So that takes us down the, uh, into chapter 22 of Genesis. Um, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from the heaven the second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now, you know, I'm just going to go a little aside here on something that's not quite related to eschatology, but it came up a few weeks ago, and lo and behold, here we have an opportunity to talk about it. So it didn't come up in here, it came up in another, uh, in another venue, but uh, it was about this particular story, and someone was finding great fault in, in the story of, of how God asked uh, Abraham to sacrifice his only son. Uh, and somebody was taking such great offense at this and thinking it was such a terrible story and was so manipulative and, and it was such a, an awful thing to make someone jump through that kind of hoop. And, and I, you know, immediately I'm quite aware of the fact that all of this is coming from a mind of unbelief. Right? Because you're just... There's no way in the world that, that somebody who actually understands the gospel and believes the gospel would, would come to those kinds of conclusions. Because if you understand and, and you believe the gospel, that story is not a manipulation of some you know, uh, maniacal god. That story is not uh, somebody who is trying to 
see how high he can get Abraham to jump when he you know, says jump. And this is not the story of, of a, a God who is somehow or another twisted and warped and needs to get his jollies in, in very strange and awful ways. And none of those things. None of those things remotely. This is a story about God showing the world how you understand what love is. God had a message that was coming, you know, about 2,000 years later. And that message was, how do you understand love from God's perspective? Now, Paul talks about this in the book of Romans. He said, this is how we know that, that God loves us. Is while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, the, the thing that really tells us that God loves us, the real thing that really tells us how God feels about us, is that he did not hold back his only son for us. He was willing to sacrifice his only son. That's how we know that God loves us. This is just a little picture language that's looking forward to that. So when you look at this story, this story is not <laughs> is not something to be seen at with unbelieving eyes that would use it to cast aspersions on the character of God. This is a story which God wanted to set in the very beginning, early in human history as it were, wanted to set a pattern, a demonstration, wanted to get it out there prophetically so that when the time came for this particular picture to become fulfilled, we would be able to understand it we would be able to understand the wonder of it and, and understand the thinking, more or less, that's in the mind of God and the heart of God concerning this. You know, people don't get the, they don't get the gospel. You know, the whole thing with the cross and, you know, crowns and thorns and getting beaten and nails and, you know, swords and or, uh, spears and all that kind of thing. People don't get it. They, they, they don't understand it. We should understand it. And God, from the very earliest days of trying to set us up for it prophetically, was putting forth something that would help us to understand it and to take it in. Uh, so the story here, not a, not a gruesome story about how scary God is, uh, because he is just really crazy. <laughs> this is really a story about God trying to show us something that was really important to learn. The thing in God's mind that really says, I love you, is laying down your only son. And that's exactly what God... But Abraham wasn't capable of doing it. God, God said, don't do it! <laughs> but he did want the demonstration to be there nonetheless. So, having said all that, let's move into this next slide here. Make sure I'm good on time. Um, we talked about how this... You know, we're looking at this, this prophetic uh, uh, map, if you will. And we started in Genesis chapter 3. Now we're moving into Genesis chapter 21 and 22. Uh, what, are we, what are we taking away from an eschatological uh, perspective uh, from these, these passages of Scripture? Uh, well, we're taking this away, that the specific human lineage for all things eschatological is the Jews. That's the line of Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Uh, now, we didn't talk about how Jacob is narrowed down, but nonetheless, he is narrowed down. Uh, demonstrating it for Isaac hopefully is sufficient. We don't want to, you, we don't want to get bogged down in every detail uh, in this, this particular study. But nonetheless, uh, it, it, I think sufficiently we, we begin to understand this from what we have looked at. Um, the Jews are more important then it would seem that a people of that size, a people of that wealth, a people of that power should be. When you look at the Jewish people, even when you look at them throughout history, they were never the greatest people as far as number. They were never the strongest people as far as, as brute strength, military force, that kind of thing. Um, they certainly uh, were not uh, uh, the most far-ranging of peoples. Um, you know, touching all the corners of the earth or whatever, not until they got kicked out of their home. Uh, the Jews, you just look at the Jewish people, you would never uh, really just from 
trying to gauge what you're seeing when you look at the Jewish people, you would never look at them and say, now this is a people that's something special. Now I know if you look at things like uh, uh, Nobel Prizes and other high prizes in various areas of, of scientific and professional endeavor, the Jews are remarkable as far as their accomplishments. But at the same point in time, uh, you just would never, never think that this people would, would be so important. I mean, even today, it, it, my entire life that I've been conscious enough to be aware of the news, it's always been filled with the Jews. There's wars going on, there's problems going on, and of course when I was younger, we were still very fresh on the, you know, the, the, the aftermath of the Holocaust and World War II. Uh, my goodness, my entire life, the Jews have been, you know, almost, almost every time you watch the news, back in the days when I watched the news, I don't watch the news anymore because the news doesn't exist anymore. Amen. <laughs> news, someplace along the line of the last few years has become propaganda. And I, I, don't, I, I don't bother with Fox News, I don't bother with MSNBC, I don't watch CNN, I certainly don't watch any of the television networks and have to wade through all those commercials that just would drive me nuts. But nonetheless, um, I, I, I don't bother with any of those things, and it's not because of the commercials, it's actually because they don't do the news anymore. It's, it's, it's debates, it's, it's propaganda, it's people posing and posturing, and and it's just so annoying. I just want, give me the facts and, you know, I'll use the brain that God has given me to try to understand things the best I can. But that's, you know, that's not what you get. So, uh, you know, don't bother with the news anymore. But when I was a kid, I used to watch the news. I used to watch the news even if my mom and dad didn't. I was a nerdy kid in some respects, I guess. But, I, you know, in all of that process, well, I tell you, hardly ever a newscast went by where something didn't have something to do with the Jews. Uh, why this people? I'll tell you why this people. It's because of a promise that God made to Abraham. This people, through that promise, have become front and center. They are the center of all things prophetic and eschatological. And just because they have been uh, out of sync with Christ over these last few thousand, you know, a couple thousand years, um, has not removed that. It, they are still the thing, they're still the ones uh, that, uh, uh, that matter as far as God getting done. Remember, when we talked about eschatology, that's why we went back to Genesis 3. Eschatology is not, you know, not just about a few little things. Eschatology is about God redeeming a broken creation. It's going to have a, his effort will have a start, started back in Genesis, right? It's also going to have an end. Eschatology is, of course, about the end, but you, you, know, you can't understand the end if you don't understand the beginning. Uh, the, the Jews are the thing that, that has everything to do with the, the process and the program and the fulfillment of everything that God has said about bringing the world to the end to conclude this effort of redeeming. Jews have everything to do with that. So, uh, not only does uh, God's prophetic word come through the Jews, we don't have any prophetic words that haven't come through the Jews, do we? That's true Old Testament, New Testament. The Apostle John was a Jew. The Apostle Peter was a Jew. Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, was a Jew. Every prophet in the Old Testament was a Jew. Every prophetic word that God has ever spoken to mankind has been spoken by a Jew. Isn't that incredible? What an awesome, what an awesome people, you know, that you have when you when you think about that. God's prophetic word comes through them, but here's the thing that's also important. Um, they are also the thing that you watch concerning the fulfillment. And this is where a lot of the Christian church really fell asleep over the last couple thousand years. Because, let's face it, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. Um, the Romans, 
as a as a people were basically not real happy or friendly with the Jews. I mean, they they, they gave them some room at the beginning, but you know, the Jewish people just are 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 trouble uh, to the people that try to reign and rule over them, and uh, they were to the Romans. Eventually, the Romans just absolutely hated them. Uh, but <laughs> the result of uh, uh, the result of all of that, I think, by the time you're in into the uh, 300s, and by the time it started being safe to be a Christian, um, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the church. And one of the things that was really uh, kind of used as a means of of kind of fomenting that and causing it to, to be more deeply placed than it otherwise would have been was was the notion that this evil, rebellious people killed Christ, the Christ killers. And, you know, some of the things even the Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament kind of give a little room for understanding those things. But the thing about it is, the Apostle Paul, certainly the Bible, never never says that that just because the Jews were were in, in a very way responsible, real way, responsible um, for rebelling against God's Messiah and causing him to be crucified, uh, it's not like that wasn't God's plan. I mean, that's exactly what God knew what would happen. That's exactly what God sent Jesus to ultimately do. So, you know, where, you know, where was the, where was the fuel uh, to feed all of that anti-Semitism for all those years? But part of that anti-Semitism theologically, and we've talked a little bit about this before, something called supersessionism. Now, supersessionism is just a fancy word that, that basically means this. The church supersedes, supersessionism, the church supersedes the Jews as God's promised people, as God's covenant people. Um, why is that Why is that a lie? Well, it's a lie because in order for it to be true, God would have to be a liar. You can't be a supersessionist without making God a liar because God made promises to Abraham and God made statements throughout the prophetic books of the Old Testament that basically said he will punish Israel. He will even send Israel away from their home. But he will never forget them. He always has a remnant. Always, always, always. And so the whole, the whole thing that, in my mind, is I try to understand where something like supersessionism comes from, in my mind, I, I basically write it off to a latent anti-Semitism that, that has been prevalent in the church ever since the days of the, you know, the Roman Empire. Um, we certainly saw that in World War II, did we not? Uh, in, a, in a place like Germany. Uh, I tell you what, they had a church at every street corner almost in Germany. Didn't stop them from adopting a devilish point of view and try to wipe out the Jews. Um, and it's not like it's not like European history isn't filled with pogroms, you know, throughout its time in which you know people would just get in the mood and all of a sudden everybody Jewish was getting burned out and chased out of town and run away and all of those kinds of things. Uh, all of that, all of those things, where do they come from? Well, they come from anti-Semitism, hatred of the Jews. And I think that that filtered into the church through the ages uh, of the church, particularly the Dark Ages. And uh, supersessionist, I think, is, is, a, is a repercussion of, of that anti-Semitism. So, never, uh, never ever forget this. God does not lie. God does not break his promise. God is true even though everyone else is a liar. You know, God will say true to his word. So, God said things to Abraham. God has said things to the Jews after <coughs> Abraham. He is not going to break any of those promises. He's not going to break any of the statements that he's made. So, do the Jews still have a place in the plan of God? Are the Jews still God's chosen people? Yes, they are. And because that's so, they are very much uh, the thing to watch. If, if you want to understand where we are in the scheme of things historically, as far as going toward the end, what do you have to look at? You have to look at the Jews. You not only listen to the Jews, right? The prophetic word came through them. Not only do you listen to them, 
but you also have to watch them. You have to watch their nation. You have to watch, watch them as a people. You have to watch their spiritual climb. Um, all of those kinds of things come into play with understanding where we are in the scheme of things as far as, as uh, where the end is, uh, when is the end, all of those kinds of questions. It always going to have everything to do with the Jews. Uh, okay, what do we learn from uh, else from these uh, passages of, of scriptures? If anything else, we just put exclamation points on some of the things I've already said. Uh, the Jews are promised an enduring nation as entailed in taking possession of the cities of their enemies. Okay, uh, this was a promise made by God uh, to Abraham and, and to his offspring, and which means that the Jews will always be a people. I, this is the thing that is most astonishing to me as somebody who likes history. I like history. I've read some really dull and boring history in my days, but I like history. Um, and it is astonishing to me that the Jewish people exist. Absolutely astonishing to me. I, I mean, I wouldn't be, I would not be astonished if they lived in some kind of little hovel camp, you know, maybe in the Middle East someplace, Jordan, or maybe down in Saudi Arabia, you know, a few thousand people living in a, you know, a glorified tent city, you know, barbed wire around the, the perimeter of their camp in the midst of maybe a, uh, folks that doesn't like them so much, uh, you know, maybe that way. But to be, to be a people with cultural cohesion, with a language and, and a cultural uh, identity, to be a people now with a nation, yeah, this is astonishing to me. And it's like you look at Israel. Israel is not. I mean, Israel's not anywhere near a third world country. My goodness, they are leaders in, in developments in science and industry. They are leaders in agricultural techniques, leaders in development of water resources. I, I, could, I, could, I could just go on and on and on and on and on, right? I mean, this little tiny New Jersey-sized country, and I say all that to say this, is that it just proves this point. The Jews are meant by God to be a people to the end. And the fact of the matter is, it, it, they are not a throwaway people. They seem like that for a while, right, in, the, in the, the depth of the diaspora. When God had sent them away, they rejected the Messiah, and, and God, God is for them. God is watching out for them, but it doesn't mean that he's going to put up with, with unbelief. It doesn't mean that he's going to put up with rebellion from God is very kind, and God is very severe. Right? It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Kindness and severity. Uh, and the Jews demonstrate that. But at the same point in time, it's just absolutely incredible that, that they are here in our day and age. Absolutely incredible that they are doing so well. Absolutely incredible that they have their homeland again. Just absolutely incredible. What could... What could be a reason for that? There isn't any other than this. God keeps his promise. Only, only reason. So when we look at the, the Jewish people, again, we hear from them, but we also have to watch them. In watching them, especially watching their revival that we're seeing now. Not their spiritual revival, but their revival as a people, as a nation. Boy, I tell you what, it says... Something's going on that's uh, pointing us toward the end. And then this, the Jews will receive all the promises made before the end. This is primarily, one of the things that we looked at in, in, in the earlier development of the prophetic map that we're, we're working on, um, is that millennial kingdom. And you, you know, you scratch your head and say, why in the world is there a millennial kingdom? Here's the thing, God made promises to the people of Israel that have not been able to be fulfilled yet. They have not been able to be fulfilled on one hand because the, because the Jews have been faithless and rebellious. On the other hand, um, they have not been able to be fulfilled because God hasn't brought the world to the kind of condition uh, that it would take for those promises to be fulfilled. God said that the Jews would become the center of the world. He said Jerusalem would be the center of the world. He said the Jews 
Uh, everybody in the world would look to the Jews. Everybody would come to Jerusalem uh, to worship God. Uh, God said all of these things about the Jews. They haven't happened yet. That doesn't mean they're not going to happen. They will happen. That's what the Millennium Kingdom is all about. And so the edge of time is not going to come in, in its final, ultimate sort of sense until every promise God made to the Jews is fulfilled. Some of them are going to be fulfilled, in, you know, uh, leading up to the rapture and the tribulation and all that happens, you know, in, the, in that period of time. And some of them are going to be filled in the millennial kingdom, leading up to the ultimate end. But every single one of them will be uh, uh, fulfilled. Which takes me to this. Now, this is a. I, this is a. There we go. Uh, this little passage right here. I wanted to. I wanted to uh, show this to you. Uh, so Isaiah 44, uh, starting with verse number six. Uh, this is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and the last. Apart from me there is no God. Uh, who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me. Now these are words of talking about plan. These are words that are talking about uh, the, the details of plan and, and uh, the, the various aspects of coordination, logistics, and everything else that go into plan. Um, let, let, you know, let me understand how one thing leads to another and gets things done that need to get done. Let him declare and lay it out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people. Right there it is, right? Who is that talking about? It's talking about the Jews. So God is here through the prophet Isaiah making a challenge to people to understand who is God and who is not. God is saying, I'm God. I'm the one you have to deal with. And here's, here's what you need to do to prove otherwise. Lay out your plan. My plan is, is out before you. Let me see you lay out your, your plan. And particularly in reference to what? The thing that he says is uh, the core of understanding God's plan uh, for the ages. Uh, it's all about the ancient people. And what is to come? Yes, let them foretell uh, what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? So God is basically saying, they can't, I have. All has to do with the Jews, right? All has to do with the ancient people. He says to everybody who would you know, try to knock him off his throne or try to get a different viewpoint across other than, than his, he says... You know, belly up to the bar, let's see what you got. You don't have anything. And, and primarily, you don't have anything because you don't understand what's going on with the Jews. Okay? Uh, you are my witnesses. Is there any gods beside me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Okay, so this is a wonderful passage in Isaiah that really brings home this point uh, from God's perspective. And that is just this. The Jews, what's going on with the Jews, that's what, that's what it's all about. It's what, it's what history is all about in the sense of understanding how is it getting to the end of time. 